So uh, it, it is basically in, in, uh, a sort of a overview of the uh, relations. In the end, what I try to do is I try to, um, you know, suggest some options available to both the sides. Uh, you know, the term India-Latin American relations. Uh, I would be talking about. I have a problem with the term itself, but I will be mentioning this, that at the very end why I have a problem with the term. So uh, I know it's sadly what we see. It is this so-called uh, good relationship, uh, friendly and cordial relationship, never transcended the the enormous communication barriers that historically existed between the two sides. So there was never anything beyond the talk. There was ne never anything beyond the rhetorics of speech. At even a popular level of perception. If you look at Latin America, if you ask in India, and if I tell somebody I'm going to Argentina, the only question they will ask, oh, you are going to see Messi. <laughs> okay. Okay. Or if you tell them about Brazil, then they will say, oh, the carnival, you know, the carnival and the samba and something else they will talk about. But if beyond Brazil and Argentina, if you tell them I'm going to Peru or Chile, they blank out. They, they are not aware of anything at popular perception. And I am quite certain that a similar perception even exists here. Okay, many times people come and they ask you that, you know, uh, there are no more kings in India and there are no more, you know, uh, you know, elephants in, in India. I mean, you do see elephants even. We are as excited to see the elephants as anybody else is. <laughs> because, you know, uh, but stereotypes are created amazingly on both sides. That is because of the lack of any historical uh, reciprocity in terms of understanding each other. Any study on Latin America or any in-depth analytical study on Latin America, keeping in mind the changing international scenario, requires that we look beyond official visits and terms of trade. Because today, you know, when you talk about international relations, then you talk about relationships between countries. First and foremost is that they will come up and say, oh, you've seen how much the trade is. The trade has increased, the trade has declined. You know, we are doing, doing good business. But we have to look beyond trade, beyond official visits, no matter how popular this is the way of looking at it. To put very simply, if you look at India's relations with Latin America, I would say that it has, it's a, it has been of a benign indifference, a studied ambivalence, an apathy for almost more than 50 years. That is not to undermine that there have not been positive developments on both sides. There have been a lot of positive developments. India and Latin America have cooperated on a number of fields, number of areas. They have spoken in the same voice at the international forum. Yet, the significant linkages between India and Latin America continue or remain minimal to say the least. In this paper, what I have tried to do is I have tried to divide into five parts. The first one I am going to talk about is the history of the linkage. A sort of a rhetorical uh, um, this is Janet. today. <laughs> okay. The second part is what I'm going to talk about is the trade. But I will not give it as the most important part of the relationship. But its significance cannot be denied. I call it as the new pragmatism with a question mark. The third specific part that I'm going to speak about is India Brazil, because that is a very important component of the <coughs> America relations today. I call it beyond regionalism and pragmatic partnership. Then I will just speak about what are the promises of the relationship and what are going to be the obstacles in the relationship and finish with some concluding remarks. Now, if you look at India-Latin America relationship, there have been historical colonial linkages. 
For example, the Portuguese were a uh, were common link between between uh, Brazil, uh, Portugal, and India, especially Goa, where I come from, where Portuguese ruled for 450 years. So there have been linkages. For instance, there has been a tremendous impact in terms of food on both sides. Um, uh, things like rice, sugar cane, um, um, pepper, cinnamon, which is part of a lot of Latin American food and diet today, comes from India. And similarly, for example, in India, things like cashews, chilies, and, and uh, tapioca, then these fruits called chikus, I really don't know what they're called, but they're called chikus. They were carried by the Portuguese uh, from Brazil to India. Apart from the food impact, there were other uh, uh, relations. For example, nobody can deny the role of the Jesuit missions in India. They played a very important role in Latin America and they played a very important role in the western coast of India. Even when it was about the freedom struggle, when India was, uh, Indian freedom struggle was on against the British, the Latin American uh, uh, people stood by the, they had great amount of empathy for this freedom struggle, they had a great amount of support for the freedom struggle, and, and uh, this, and it sort of gave a lot of impetus and boost for those who were fighting for freedom in India. However, in the post-independence area, Change, situation changed considerably. Now, both sides followed divergent policies in international relations. Some were reasons of domestic cause, some were as an outcome of the international scenario in which they existed. Despite the divergence, there was commonality as an agenda against colonialism and imperialism. Now, interestingly, Jawaharlal Nehru, who has been known as the father of India's foreign policy, apart from being India's first prime minister, is, is uh, uh, his attitude towards Latin America needs a bit of mention, and that I will talk in the context of existing uh, scenarios for India and for, for Latin America in the early 60s. <coughs> in 19... Uh, uh, 62 or, 60, or 61, just after the Bay of Pigs invasion, um, Jawaharlal Nehru has visited, had visited the um, UN and uh, he was asked about the Bay of Pigs invasion. And I will just quote his reply to that. He said that, and I quote, some kind of invasion on Cuba from outside, it may be from some part of the United States, Central America, or some other place. If that is so, it does seem to be a part of a case of intervention. Nehru was also very, very upset with the way the Latin Americans had not supported India on the Korean crisis. And he felt that the will of Asia had been flouted by those Americans. So, uh, and finally, when I believe he was asked, invited by Castro to visit Cuba, um, he said, and I quote that, I have plenty of work in my own country. So despite, uh, so, so despite the fact that he visited Latin America, in fact he visited a number of countries. He, went, he visited, he visited uh, Cuba, he visited Chile, he visited Argentina Chile, and Brazil. And in fact he had trade and commercial relations with uh, all these countries. He avoided absolutely Cuba at that point of time. And it was understandable given the fact that India was in a particular kind of international situation. So whatever cooperation one sees is one can call them as coincidental and not as a result of cooperative behavior. The visit of Indira Gandhi subsequently in 1969 is, 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 is of a great amount of significance because for the first time it, Latin America was part of the Indian foreign policy agenda. It was mentioned as a foreign policy statement and Indira Gandhi said that India and the countries of Latin America had common ideals. She visited a number of countries, incidentally she did not visit Cuba. She did not visit Cuba and uh, uh, she visited Brazil, she visited Trinidad, she visited a number of other countries. What was most interesting about her visit was that for the first time 
there was, uh, not only did she speak about it in the parliament, but also she came about, there were a lot of positive outcomes of this visit. For example, one of the positive outcome was the establishment of the diplomatic missions in Peru and in Venezuela. Apart from that, she was also very keen to establish and what was result, or later on resulted as studies or chairs devoted to or centers devoted to studying Latin American studies. Okay, so this was some of the positive results. Apart from that, she signed with Brazil some agreements. And when she went back to India and justifying her visit at the parliament, which is the, which is the elected house of representatives in India, she said, and I quote, in principle, to promote cooperation between two countries, this is about Brazil, uh, uh, in the field of development of atomic energy for peaceful purposes is, real, is a form to conclude a new future and agreement to facilitate such cooperation. When she was asked to justify her visit and she said, the political and economic realities of contemporary world make it essential for us to constantly renew and establish our international links. <laughs> it is to our advantage and our national interest to forge closer relations with larger uh, number of proud and resurgent nations of South America and the Caribbean. She promised a new Latin American uh, policy and as I mentioned to you, they were joint communicate with Brazil over the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Now, after her visit, there was a lot of encouragement in order to get some businesses between the two sides. Now, the FICI, which is the Federation of Indian Chamber of, of, of Industries, when it came to in, in Latin America, they identified certain handicaps. In fact, these handicaps probably speak well about the relationship for the next two to three decades. That it was lack of planned and scientific marketing strategy, lack of contact, and non-availability of public <coughs> services. Um, the person from the Indian Embassy is there, he might well, you know, support me and, because I think it is only a few months ago the first direct shipping links have been established between <coughs> India and Latin America. Now, so what we see was over the next few decades that sporadically and intermittently there were overtures of friendship, but they were absolutely issue-based. There was no larger planning or strategizing in order to improve the relationship. In fact, in the 1980s, when the Falkland crisis happened, India and as well as the non-aligned movements supported the Argentine claim. Now, some of the obstacles and challenges talked about by the Indian side for a number of years, too far flung for trade, not really considered, therefore, as a strategic partner, too far. Now, when you look at the Latin American side, the situation was not any better. They had their own tribulations, their own transitions to democracy, to, to dealing with the economic crisis that was happening in Latin America. So it wasn't as though they showed any kind of, uh, you know, the other side, any kind of extra keenness to sort of improve their relations with India. Now, with the end of, the, of communism and in fall of Soviet Union in East Europe, it, it meant a lot of things to many nations. For Europe, for, for United States, it had a different story. For India, it was a different thrill. So we look at it as a benchmark for a different reason. For the first time, not only were there many, many opportunities available for these countries because of the end of superpower rivalry, you had to identify and establish new friends, new, new allies, and new relationships. But it also meant for the first time that there was a huge power vacuum created. And there were this unleashed unprecedented forces and new opportunities to explore, establish and sustain relationships, which was no longer overwhelmed by you know superpower rivalry. India felt that India and Latin America had comparative levels of development, there were complementarities, and this would work. Uh, to grow, have a robust geopolitical relationship. There were a number of visits, including the visit of Menem, 
when Menem uh, cited many issues that uh, Argentina was facing and it was also supported by India because they agreed to it. In India, therefore, there was an urgent need to have a coherent and comprehensive strategy towards Latin America and the Caribbean. There was too much of dithering. There were too many ad hoc and peace ring solutions in the past. Uh, there was a move now within the region for a well-identified and clearly demarcated country-specific issue of, uh, of cooperation. So therefore, in this scenario, trade emerged as the most important agenda. Now interestingly, it was in 1997 that the Ministry of Commerce came up with this, this idea, uh, this program called uh, Focus Lab, and in which they identified eight countries in the region to, uh, to have better relations in terms of trade and economic relations. Uh, the obstacles that were talked about continue to be the same, distance, language barriers, inadequacy of information, uh, absence of shipping, lines, etc. However, there is this list of things that were, were, were established under this Focus Lab program. And basically, if, if one looks at it, it is about integrating, it is about having more institutions working towards uh, uh, working towards improving the relationship between both sides. And secondly, what was interesting is that no longer the Indian foreign policy was looking at the whole region as one. No more 34 countries to be treated in similar manner. For the first time, they identified that these are going to be our partners in this. So in a sense, there both was a positive step away from the past. Now these are all the uh, list. I mean, these are also available on the Ministry of Commerce website. Talks about all the things that you know uh, they were laid down under the under the policy of Focus Lab. Uh, I will quickly go over this. Um. Now, although I, I personally do not, uh, as I mentioned, do not think that trade is the only thing that you know. There is this argument, you know, when you improve trade, relationship improves. But I think that it has a certain amount of limitation. But it is interesting to look at the at the figures of trade. Now, total bilateral trade between the Latin region and India increased from 1.7 billion in 2001 and 2 to 28.3 billion in 11 to 12. Indian exports grew from 751.95 million to 12.27 billion. That is an increase of 1,532% over the last 10 years. Similarly, the imports grew from 943.98 million to 16.3 billion, and the growth is 1598%. And the percentage of exports to Latin America in India's total global exports grew from 1.72% to 5.05% in 2012-13. Apart from that, India has signed a number of preferential trade agreements with countries like Colombia, Chile, Brazil, and Venezuela. Now, no foreign policy talk of India can be complete without talking about China. Well, um, you know, I, I was I was in, in Rio and and uh, you know we were walking around the uh, the road and they showed me a building where there is a slab, uh, on one slab of the building says India, the very next slab says China. And I made a joke there that, you know, we can't escape the Chinese even here. We are here too, we are put next to the Chinese. Well, the China factor is important in this relationship because in the last 10 years or so, China has been focusing tremendously on Latin America. It has, in, it has invested or has promised to invest huge amounts of money in Latin America. In 2004, if I'm not mistaken, when Hu Jintao visited here, he promised $100 billion for the region in terms of infrastructure, ports, railways, and other things. And China is also uh, strongly integrated in many countries in terms of oil exploration. That is very important because given the fact that in China and India, the two countries that are growing tremendously need energy resources, uninterrupted energy resources for years to come in order to maintain the level of growth. And most of India's 
and China's sources of energy are presently in conflict areas. For example, a lot of oil comes from India from the Middle East and it's not really somewhere you can trust given the fact the situation there. So India, like China, is looking at other partners from where they can explore, explore oil in order to keep, get this development going. So when India realized that the presence of China was, was becoming more and more in Latin America, China was outbidding India in terms of getting oil contracts, the closeness of China, for example, in Venezuela in terms of exploring oil, it was absolutely important for India to therefore uh, improve. China factor became important for looking at Latin America from a different perspective. Now, given the fact that the Chinese really did not have uh, cordial or good relations with most of the countries of Latin America in the past, unlike India, India realized its failure in terms of exploring that good relationship. That you had pushed it to the very end and now you had to compete with China to, you know, and it was, it was going to be difficult. So, off late in, in, in Latin America, India is engaging with countries rather than individual countries, rather than going whole hog towards a sweeping policy. And the most important of this is, of course, India's relations with Brazil. Now, India's relations with Brazil has, has changed considerably. Uh, not only the presidents of Brazil, Enrique Cardoso or Lula, visited many, many times India, uh, but the relationship has gone beyond just heads of state visits. Uh, the idea of bilateralism here is not uh, is, 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 is gone beyond the South, is, is something which needs to concretize the South-South cooperation. Um, there have been many areas where things have improved, for example, bilateral trade. Apart from that, we have Brazil and India have many agreements on health, knowledge-driven industries, oceanography, agriculture, railways, pharmaceuticals. Uh, two years ago, we had a conference in, in my university. It was an international conference we did on India-Brazil. We called it India-Brazil Dialogue. And who would be surprised, we actually invited some of the business people. I mean, we could not manage to get many. But we invited some of the business people from Brazil who are doing business in, 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 in India. And you would be surprised to know that we received the person from Embraer, the the, the aircraft manufacturer, yes, and they told us, and I when I was reading that when you know Celso uh, Amorim had visited in 2004, he had signed with India and they had purchased five aircrafts in 2004. In 2011, the number had increased to 169 aircrafts. So already you could see that you know there has been a tremendous increase. Um, <coughs> apart from that. India and Brazil have, have had uh, uh, interests and developed uh, similar voices in number of international fora, uh, whether it is about development, it is about environment, it is about reform of the UN, the idea of the G4, that they are both members of EPSA, BRICS, G15, G22. And there has been an increase in number of bilateral visits in the last couple of years. I will give you an example of that. Because that speaks uh, a lot. Uh, between 1947 and 1997, only 12 presidential visits from Latin America to India took place. And in between 2001 and 2011, there were already 10. So what took 50 years, it was overshadowed by the last 10 years. And that shows a change in the uh, positive change in the mindset. In fact, to quote Celso Amoran uh, in the interview he gave to the Hindu, which is a conservative newspaper in India, he said, India, Brazil and South Africa are natural candidates with reasonable degree of stability and international harmony. This, uh, he was talking about the creation of the IPSA. Uh, <coughs> apart from that, there is, uh, there has been, uh, Brazil is projecting itself as a potential weapons uh, supplier in India as well and there was uh, under the agreement of military-military cooperation, jungle warfare, 
general survival training, all these things were in, included in that. Uh, the idea was that you know, that Brazilian, I, somebody was telling me the Brazilians were very successful in dealing with smuggling in the Amazon using this kind of technology, jungle technology. And I think the Indian government was keen to learn given the fact that, you know, uh, the naxals in India are, 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 are used the forest very, very effectively. But I do not know what happened to the idea after that. The, another important sector that India is looking towards Brazil is to learn about alternative fuel biofuel or ethanol. Brazil, it seems, has successfully used that to deal with some of its energy issues. And India is keen to learn that given the fact, as I mentioned, the need of sustained energy. However, the relationship has undergone a tremendous metamorphosis. However, both the countries have their own particular issues to deal with in their own, uh, in their own uh, regions as well. Now, what are the future issues and what are going to be the pitfalls? What are going to be the challenges? Now, the first thing that one talks when we talk about India Latin America is we never talk about the Indian people in Latin America, people of Indian origin. You know, there are so there's so much of literature written about diaspora in India. And there are many people who consider diaspora to be an asset. However, whenever we talk about people of Indian origin, it they find no mention in any literature on India Latin America. Somehow we have not been able to, in a good way, take advantage of the people living here. And given the fact that a significant number of Indian people living in countries like Trinidad, Tobago, Guyana, Suriname, and many of the islands of the Caribbean, we have not been able to use them as an asset to you know, integrate or improve this relationship with Latin America. Now, when you look at the people of Indian origin here in Latin America, most of them are always talked to about as culture, music, dance, you know, those things, but not as a strategic asset. Secondly, uh, somehow the cultural and educational initiatives have not taken off. That is, for instance, the Brazilians had uh, some chairs in India, or the Latin, uh, Indian, uh, Latin Brazilian studies chairs. In fact, uh, some many years ago, the Argentine government used to have this essay competition. And it was very good because, you know, it encouraged students to read about Argentina and write about Argentina, their ideas on Argentina. And they were awarded with a big scroll and, you know, some money, which was always an incentive for anybody working. And it, it created a really good image about Argentina, but it, it and also the, the most important part was that it was published. So it was your first publication, so that's all the all the ingredients for something really good, but it didn't, it just died off after some time. And I say this because I was one of the persons who got an award, and it was a huge money in those days, and I still have that huge scroll given to me by the Argentine ambassador at that point of time, and it was, it, it made me feel very proud and continued, you know, in a sense, encourage the continued study of Latin America. However, in, 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 the, in, in the last couple of years, we have uh, some positive developments, like for example, the ECLAC report on, on India and Latin America and the Caribbean, opportunities and challenges, and also this was followed by the Inter-American Development Bank. Some other positive uh, uh, things are that there have been an increase in the Latin American missions in India, and the Indian missions in the region, and there have been serious inroads of Indian companies in Latin America. Lots and lots and lots of business is happening in, in, in this region. In fact, during that particular seminar that I was mentioning to you, I met one gentleman who owns what is called Renuka Sugars. It is a, he lives in a place called Belgaum, which is a really a small place in the state called Karnataka. They own the largest sugar mill in Brazil. Okay, so it, it was amazing that these are the things that are happening in, uh, so these are some of the positive remarks. Now to conclude, I would say, the first and foremost trouble that I have is with the term, the coinage of the term India Latin America. You know, when you talk about India Latin America, when you talk of such kind of, uh, you know, you hyphenate the word, usually you mean 
that two entities which are somewhere equal in terms of, or you are giving that kind of, you know, that kind of importance in terms of equality. Usually, it is about a country. Okay. However, the moment you term it as India, Latin America, immediately you do not give that region that kind of respect. You are trying to hyphenate a country with a region, which is absolutely for the first time talking of imbalance. That shows your apathy. That shows your indifference. Because if you look, if you talk about India-Brazil, which is now we are talking about, you should talk about India-Brazil, India-Argentina, India-Peru, giving each and every country its own identity. They are different people, different, absolutely different from each other in terms of identity, in terms of uh, where they are located, in terms of their specificities. So, first and foremost, that is very important. When you identify that, then I think we will stop using this hyphenated word India Latin America. Because given the fact that when we talk about countries that are important to us, we never club them together. We never talk of India, Russia as India, um, CIS. Or we never even talk about India, Nepal as India, South Asia. We talk India, Nepal, India, Nepal. India, Sri Lanka. Okay. India, Malaysia. Okay. So, the first and foremost thing is that we stop this particular approach to looking at the region. Uh, because not only them, I think we would also not like if tomorrow people in any country said uh, La Argentina South Asia relations because we are we although are, are located in South Asia, we are us. So that is very important. Uh, so therefore it is no wonder that after five decades of independent foreign policy making, we still remain prisoners of India Latin America relations. Uh, this uh, kind of indifference needs to be vigorously shaken off. In the last decade, the government has done great in terms of, of initiatives and the private sector has also done wonders because it has managed to open up new vistas for India-Latin Latin America relationship in terms of especially trade and investment. Um, the, uh, there have been, as I mentioned, there have been steady increase in visits from both sides and, uh, and uh, there have been a number of uh, options available, not a uh, lot of uh, ideas put forward how to improve, how to strengthen this relationship. <coughs> For example, the ECLAC report comes up with a number of things on infrastructure, competitiveness, innovation, etc., etc., many of these in initiatives. Now, as India emerges not only as a valuable trade partner to Latin American nations, but the new sto India story is, is very attractive. India is a stable democracy, has uninterrupted <coughs> democracies more than six decades since its independence. It has deep cultural roots and this sort of resonates with the Latin Americans in the 21st century. Now, there are no dearth of issues or possible arenas to anchor India-Latin America relations uh, as meaningful partners in the international context. Nevertheless, what it requires is a, is a great amount of political will on the power of the ruling sides on both, both sides. It is true that India-Latin America have never been terra incognita to each other. They have to travel a long way from becoming active by bilateral and multilateral partners. In any case, civilizational and cultural differences need not come in the way of long sustaining relationships, mutually enriching relationships between two sides. After all, these are not unsurmountable differences. The day that is not far off that when the global world order will metamorphically re represent a multicultural palimpsest uh, where nations will be free to contribute their own scripts. And in this vision of multipolar world that opens up the vista of opportunities for possibilities for India and countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, the increasing proximity and growing cooperation on various fronts is bound to contribute 
to the unfolding of a more humane global order.